Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for today's A Month of Service presentation of the power of HOAs, the truths, myths, and everything in between. My name is Nia Murray. I am Programs Coordinator with Neighborhood Recovery Community Development Corporation, and we are one of the partners in the A Month of Service um, program. Uh, also included in the partnership is the City of Houston's Department of Neighborhoods, and joining us today is Ms. Myra Hippolyte. Uh, and also our presenting partner for today with Lone Star Legal Aid, Mr. Amir Bafrui. Bef okay, it. all right. <laughs> as, as many times as you've been here, I'm, I'm, I so apologize for still messing up your last name. But uh, also included in the partnership is uh, Houston Bar Association, uh, Houston Volunteer Lawyers, the Old Carl Institute, Harris County Appraisal District, Harris County Tax Assessor Collector's Ooh. Office. And together we make up a month of service. And what a month of service is, is basically a collaboration of these eight different organizations that come together on a monthly basis that offer a variety of workshops, uh, resources, information relative to uh, asset protection, um, asset building, uh, community empowerment, uh, and maintaining of generational wealth. Uh, generational wealth, basically. Um, we know that there's a lot of information that a lot of underserved communities do not have uh, access to uh, resources that they don't know about, uh, like the services of uh, legal service organizations like Lone Star Legal Aid. So we wanted to make sure for those families or those homeowners that are experiencing, still experiencing financial hardship or um, that are having issues or have, uh, if those service, those community leaders in different uh, areas have questions about HOA or uh, HOAs that are foreclosing, you know, due to um, assessment fees, annual fees that are being, you know, delinquent and, and so on and so forth, um, that you get the right information. And it also allows you the opportunity to, uh, to, to know who it is that you can actually reach out to in case you find yourself in need of other uh, civil legal uh, services. Um, information that is provided here today is for educational purposes only. Uh, it is not to be considered as legal advice. However, again, we do encourage you to reach out to our legal service uh, uh, partners that are uh, part of a month of service so that you can get any assistance that you that you may need. Uh, but this is your opportunity today to, to, to ask the legal expert uh, any questions that you may have in regards to uh, HOAs and foreclosure for HOAs and so on and so forth. Um, but do please keep in mind that uh, we are on a live uh, platform uh, on our Facebook page at Amos Houston TX, as well as the session is being recorded so that we can send out a link for everyone to go back and view this session again or to share with someone else that may find the information to be beneficial as well. So we do encourage you to type whatever questions it is that you have in the chat. Um, feel free to unmute yourself at the end of the presentation and ask questions directly. But uh, please keep in mind, we, we, can, we can protect your privacy as much as we can. So we ask that you try to keep your questions to be as general as you possibly can uh, and not give any specific detail about your own personal uh, situation. Meaning don't give us your address, the subdivision you live in, who's your HOA president and they live at blah, blah, blah. You know, don't give us any of that information. So uh, with, being, with that being said, uh, I'd like for us to go ahead. We're going to introduce um, Ms. Meyer with the City of Houston and um, and our uh, our presenter for today, Mr. Amir, and we will move right on into our presentation. One other thing I did want to add. Oh, oh, hold on. One other thing I did want to add also, well, actually two things. One uh, for certain is that uh, information for those that are watching us on Facebook or uh or from different areas. Uh, information that is presented here today is are for laws that are relative to the state of Texas. It is not just for the city of Houston or Harris County or anything like that. Uh, so if, if you're joining us from other areas, know that this information is applicable uh, to you as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, for those attorneys that are joining us today, if you see a course number outside of our legal service, uh, outside of our uh, our legal uh, workshops that has a course number there, then the Houston Bar Association does sponsor a uh, free CLE credit for you uh, to take advantage of uh, if you are an attorney and you need those credits. So that's all I needed to say. So Myra, go right ahead. Thanks, Ms. Nia. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Amir. Thank you for everything that you always do for us. Uh, we want to welcome you. My name is Myra Hippolyte, and I work with the City of Houston Department of Neighborhoods under the direction of Division Manager Paul Green. 
And on behalf of Mayor Sylvester Turner and Director Takasha Francis, we want to welcome you to the Month of Service Partnership. This partnership is all about giving back free information to the Houston Harris County State of Texas community. Guys, we want to make sure that you know that you're not alone through whatever stressor you're going through in your life. Um, many times when we're going stressor through a stressor in our lives, we don't know what's the first step we need to do. You know, step one, two, three. First thing, of course, we all panic. And that's why we created the month of service. We don't want you to panic. We want you to have as much information as you can right in front of you so you can make the right decisions. Um, and it, it, it make comfortable decisions, not just something that's off the wall. Guys, thank you so much. It takes you to come in and join our virtual workshops to get educated in the process. Thank you guys and stay safe. Great, um, Mr. Amir. All right, thank you all for having me here today. And thank you so much for that, that, that gracious introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and start the slideshow so we can talk about this very important topic that has a lot of uh, misunderstandings, misinformation, rumor, innuendo. Um, that's why I you know, wanted to title this presentation in a way that caught people's attention. Um, truths, myths, and everything in between, everything that Texans really need to know about homeowners associations and their powers in the state of Texas. As Ms. Murray mentioned earlier, my presentation here today is talking about Texas law, not just Houston or Harris County specific laws. So if you are tuning in from the greater Houston area, great, welcome neighbors. Um, if you're tuning in from a different part of the state, this presentation is gonna be equally applicable to you or anyone that you may know who lives in either a subdivision or a condominium tower that has a homeowners association. So let's get right to it. So as Ms. Murray mentioned, um, today's presentation is only going to provide legal information, not legal advice. I highly, highly encourage any of y'all who attend today's presentation who have questions, save them for the end. Um, I will not be able to give individual legal advice today, but I can give you a little bit of guidance and, and perhaps some more specific legal information. But um, if you have additional questions about your specific situation afterwards, I encourage you to reach out to a lawyer or a relevant professional like a tax professional or financial advisor uh, for help answering your specific question because I will not be able to answer it today. So today's agenda, we're gonna cover a number of topics. The first three to five minutes will be general information about Lone Star Legal Aid for those of you who maybe have never heard of this law firm um, and don't know what we do. Um, I'm also gonna talk about the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund Program or TX Half. Uh, that's a powerful program that can help a lot of homeowners who might be struggling with debt related to homeownership. And then we're gonna do our deep dive into everything HOA related, um, what they are, how they work, common issues, and how when things go sideways, a homeowners association more than likely can try to foreclose and take your house. Um, and then we'll finish up with a deeper dive on the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund. I wanna tease it at the beginning and then talk about it more specifically at the end of the presentation and how it can apply to helping people who are navigating issues with their HOAs or their homeowners association. So my name is Amir Bafrui. I'm a managing attorney of the Foreclosure Prevention Project at Lone Star Legal Aid. We are a civil legal law firm. That means we handle legal issues um, that don't involve jail time. So if you have a legal issue that you know, involves the threat of a fine from the government, uh, like speeding tickets or um, the threat of jail time for violating, for allegedly violating some law, Lone Star Legal Aid is prohibited by law from helping you. But if you're facing a civil legal issue, and I'm gonna get into exactly what civil legal issues mean in a few slides, Lone Star Legal Aid may be a resource that can provide you with legal information or some more tailored legal advice. I encourage everyone to check out our website and our social media channels. Again, I'll go into those in more detail, where we regularly update people on um, legal information that's relevant to our community. So a couple of facts, um, Lone Star Legal Aid, we have 14 offices. We're headquartered here in Houston where I live, uh, but we have offices all throughout the greater East Texas and upper Gulf Coast region. For example, in the greater Houston area, we have an office in Galveston, in Conroe, in Richmond, in Fort Bend County, 
and out in the city of Clute, which is in Brazoria County. Counting the Houston office, that's five offices to serve the greater Houston area. In addition to that, we have offices in Beaumont, Nacogdoches, all the way up to Texarkana. And we also serve parts of the central Texas region in Waco and offices in Belton. Uh, on another slide, I'll be more specific with all of the offices that we have. With these 14 offices, we serve 72 Texas counties and four counties in southwestern Arkansas. Um, based upon the most recent census data in those 72 Texas counties, there's over 2 million people who qualify for legal services. Now, to put that in greater perspective, Lone Star Legal Aid is the only uh, nonprofit legal services organization serving these 72 counties. And there's about 400 staff at our firm. Not all of us are lawyers. We have paralegals, secretaries, um, non-lawyer managers. Um, but we do the best we can to help as many people out of that 2 million um, that you see there. <coughs> and this last stat um, is a bit out of date. I apologize for not updating it. Um, in 2019, our firm handled over 19,000 individual legal cases for uh, a myriad of individual clients. Now, in 2021, I can tell you that number was closer to 25,000. We do as much help, we provide as much help as we have the time and resources to be, to provide to the, the clients who live in our area. So who do we help? Well, anyone, really. Um, if you're a United States citizen, a green card holder, or otherwise in the United States uh, with proper documentation, we can provide you with free legal services if you meet our qualifications. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. Um, as I mentioned um, on point number five here, in Texas, there's roughly one lawyer for every 380 people. And Texas has got 29 million people. You can figure out how many lawyers that works out to be uh, if you use that ratio. <clears throat> However, uh, for legal aid attorneys, there's actually one legal aid attorney for every 17,000 eligible people. Now, not everyone in Texas is eligible for free legal services through legal aid, uh, but those of them who are, uh, there's, the ratio is one to 17,000. So while we can't help everyone, we do the very best we can to efficiently and effectively help as many as we possibly can. And our client population runs the gamut. We help veterans. Uh, we have a presence in Belton near Fort Hood, but we help veterans throughout the state. Uh, we help, you know, LGBTQ youth. Uh, we help children, uh, people with disabilities, families with children. You name it, if you qualify for our services, we've probably helped that community. Um, and, 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 and what we try to really do is overcome isolation by helping people throughout Texas, not just in the greater Houston area or just in the urban areas, but really throughout rural counties in that 72 county area that I mentioned earlier. Our mission here at Lone Star Legal Aid is to provide free legal services to ensure equal access to justice for low-income Texans. Now, sometimes that involves legal information like we're gonna talk about today, legal information on our website, legal information for this presentation. Uh, more often than not, for uh, the clients we're able to help, it involves you know, providing legal advice or you know, full representation where we help some people in court or with documents or what have you. Excuse me. So as I mentioned before, in terms of the type of work that we do, we don't handle criminal cases. When I say criminal, I want you to think jail time or a fine from the government. But when I think when I say civil, I want you to think about some of the points I make on this next slide. So civil legal issues can really be boiled down to a number of things. Um, I have bullet points on this slide. Consumer legal issues, employment law, family law, health care, housing, juvenile justice issues problems in your neighborhood. Uh, we've gotten a lot of publicity for helping, you know, neighborhoods in the greater Houston area, you know, fight back against dump, you know, illegal dump sites and, 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 and um, concrete plants that are exceeding their permit to pollute public education issues. And we help people handle public benefits and finan <coughs> excuse me, financial assistance issues. So I just talked about that in terms of a lawyer. I can't help it. I've been doing this for 10 years, went to law school for three before that. Let me boil it down to four points for y'all if you take nothing else from this presentation. We can help you with the issues related to your home, where you lay your head at night, your car, how you get around, your money, so how you pay your bills, whether that's through unemployment benefits, wages, um, social security benefits, or food stamps, and your family, family, like family law issues, so custody issues, child support, divorces. House, home, not just houses, but apartments, 
home, car, money, kids. If you remember nothing else, remember those four things. Legal aid handles legal issues for people in those general categories. Now we also have special projects. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, I am the managing attorney of our foreclosure prevention project. So you can take a guess at what I do. I help me and my staff and I help clients throughout our 72 Texas County service area prevent the foreclosure of their biggest asset, their biggest investment, their home, the place you lay your head at night. Uh, but in addition to that, we have a number of other specialty projects to help people with more nuanced issues, uh, nuanced legal issues. I'll tell you, in my 10 plus years of practicing law, I'll tell you, tell you, most people know when they have a problem, but a lot of people don't know when they have a legal problem. There's a reason there's a lot of lawyer jokes out there, but no one's saying, you know, a lot of people say there's too many lawyers, but no one's saying there's too many legal issues. Um, we have a variety of people in place to help um, people navigate the variety of legal issues that just pop up in everyday life. So how can you ask for help? I mentioned that our firm provides free legal services to people who qualify. So to start that process, you have to apply. And we have two easy ways to apply for our services. You can contact us at the 1-800 number listed on this slide. I'm gonna read it out for those who may be tuning in <clears throat> on their phone or who may be uh, visually impaired. It's 1-800-733-8394. In addition to that, uh, and you can call that number Monday through Friday between eight and five. Um, in addition to applying on, uh, uh, through the phone, you can also apply online at our website, which I will read out, um, which is www.lonestarlegal.org. And there's an online application process. It's very simple. It doesn't take a lot of your time. I highly encourage anyone who might think they have a legal issue to contact us. And if you don't live in our 72 Texas counties, there are two other legal aid organizations that serve the rest of the state. We will make a referral to one of those. We'll get you taken care of. So as I mentioned before, we have 14 offices and I'd like to direct you to this picture that you see here. Uh, this is a picture of our downtown Houston office. It's right downtown if you're familiar. It's at the corner of Fannin and Bell, very close to South Texas College of Law, Houston, my law school. Um, and here is a list of <clears throat> some of our 14 other offices. So as I mentioned before, we have an office in Beaumont, an office in Belton in Central Texas, Bryan near College Station, Clute down in Brazoria County near Angleton, Conroe north of Houston, the Galveston office on the island, our Houston office, our headquarters. We're also in Longview, uh, we have an office in Nacogdoches, Paris, Texas, Texarkana, Tyler, Texas, Richmond, and Waco. Throughout our, we, we try to do the best, we, we do the best we can with our 14 offices to help as many people in the 72 Texas counties that we serve. Um, and <clears throat> before we get to the more specific portions of this presentation, I want to encourage those of you who are interested to follow Lone Star Legal Aid on social media. We have a number of social media channels on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, where we regularly post either short videos or um, helpful flyers that display some of the free legal information that's relevant to those of y'all in our community. So as I mentioned on the agenda, I wanna give you a brief introduction to the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund, or you might hear me refer to it as Texas Half or TX Half. The Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund is a uh, pot of money that the federal government allocated to all 50 states, but in Texas, we call it the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund. Um, this was made uh, as part of the American Rescue Plan Act. A lot of people know that is the COVID relief bill that passed in March of 2021. Um, the state of Texas <coughs> excuse me, has this program to assist um, homeowners who have been financially impacted by COVID-19 who are struggling with their home ownership debts. Through Texas Half, you can get grants of money to help you pay your mortgage, your taxes, homeowners insurance or flood insurance um, or windstorm insurance or um, uh, your HOA dues, which is important for what we're gonna talk about today. Now uh, the website for the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund is www texashomeownerassistance.com. I'm gonna say that one more time, www.texashomeownerassistance.com. 
You can also contact them um, if you're not you know, comfortable using the internet or maybe you don't have a reliable connection. Their phone number for the Texas HAP program is 1-833-651-3874. And that phone number is live Monday through Friday, 8 to 6 p.m. The uh, staff at that phone number are great. I've talked to them a number of times. Now, more specifics about the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund. This program went live in March of this year. So we're looking at really six, seven months of the program being operational. Uh, there are eligibility guidelines, which are detailed on the website. And we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail towards the end of the presentation. Um, what I wanna highlight is that any individual homeowner who qualifies for, for assistance through Texas HAP can get up to $65,000 to help them with their homeownership debts. That's the maximum benefit that you can get. That's a lot of money. Let me tell you how it can be divided. Um, if you're just behind on your mortgage, you don't have issues with your taxes, HOA, or your insurance, you can get up to $65,000 to bring you current. Um, additionally, <clears throat> the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund recently started a program where they're gonna start paying people's mortgages for three months into the future. That's a max. Um, but out of that $65,000 cap, um, if you have issues or you're behind on taxes, insurance, or HOA debt, there is a, a, a sub pot of money, if you will, uh, where you can get up to $25,000 to help you pay your taxes, insurance of any kind, uh, not life insurance or health insurance, but anything related to your home, and HOA debt. So if you combine those two, if you can get a max of $25,000 toward those property charge debts. Um, then you can get another $40,000 to pay towards the mortgage. This is a great program. It's a generational program. I've never seen anything like it in the 10 plus years I've been practicing. Um, I encourage anyone who may be struggling with any homeownership debt to go to the website, www.texashomeownerassistance.com. Call the phone, phone number, 833-651-3874, um, and, and, and see if you're eligible and, and see if you can get some help. Now, I'm not here just to be a shill for the program, uh, but as a lawyer who regularly fights foreclosures, I'm looking for all the tools in my toolbox, and Texas Half is the newest, shiniest tool right at the top of the toolbox. It's seven months old. It's a great program for those who qualify, and I've been able to help a number of my clients who, but for this program, would have been foreclosed upon. So let's talk about understanding homeowners associations. <clears throat> the basics here is that there are way too many acronyms. You might hear the word property owners association or POA or homeowners association or HOA or condominium owner association or COA. I'm gonna use the term HOA or homeowners association interchangeable. That's gonna cover all of these. They're all the same legal thing. Um, there's a few nuances, but I will cover those later. HOAs are contractually created organizations. They are not written in the tablets handed down by Moses. They're, create, they're creations of man in writing, in contracts, to generally bind people um, in relatively new subdivisions. They were you know, you see most of them popping up in the 50s, and they're very, very um, popular now. Um, but they're created um, by contract. They're, they create private nonprofit corporations that, in theory, can govern themselves, but they are subject to following the law and following certain government regulations. So we're going to talk about a few more basics. How do HOAs get formed? They get formed when articles of incorporation are filed. In, with the uh, state of Texas. They have their powers or rights to control what you do in your subdivision and, and how houses can be built and what they have to look like um, from a set of documents, either called it, uh, you know, a declarations of rights and restrictions or um, something called <coughs> covenants, conditions and restrictions or CCNR is the same thing, just different HOAs call them different things, but essentially it's these are the HOA's powers, and these are the rules you as the homeowner have to follow. HOA's can also issue bylaws, which are generally like the rules that govern the HOA itself. We're going to have to, like an example of bylaws are, we're going to have meetings on the fourth Thursday of the third quarter of every year. And if we're ever going to have another meeting, we're going to give you 30 days notice of that meeting that's not regularly scheduled. Um, they can also issue rules and regulations. So if you live in a condo that maybe has a pool, 
or if you live in a subdivision that maybe has a tennis court, they can set the rules like the hours that the pool or the hours that the tennis court is open. It's open from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. Um, you have to get you know, an access card, what have you. Now, who controls the HOA? Well, the HOA, as I mentioned before, is in theory a self-governing organization. They're nonprofits. They have elected board members. Now, these board members, as I'm going to detail later, are your neighbors. They're not being paid. Um, they might have copying fees or, or coffee paid for by the organization, but they're generally volunteers. <clears throat> and sometimes they're appointed. We'll talk about that. But most of the time they're elected. So the Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions. Now, you might hear me refer to this as the declarations or the CCNRs. These are contracts that create the Property Owners Association or the HOA. I'm sorry, I broke my promise. HOA, that's the only term I'm going to use today. Generally, the property developer drafts and files this contract in the local jurisdiction's deed record, and that allows the HOA to run with the land. So let's take a, back, let's take a step back from the lawyer language literally taking a step back. Um, what does that mean? Think about it like this. If you live in any of the major cities or even in some of the you know smaller cities like Nacogdoches, Longview, what have you, you've probably seen new neighborhoods get developed in the last 10, 20, 30 years, depending on how old you are. If those neighborhoods had an HOA, what happens is there's a bunch of dirt, right? I live out in Katy, that's a suburb of Houston. Just used to be a bunch of rice paddies. Before the houses got built out here, the developer, you know, let's just call it Johnson Development, the Johnson Development signed some documents called declarations and it said for all this land that we own out in Katy, all this rice paddy, we're going to have this HOA attached to this dirt. And then they go file it in the government records that you have to file it in. And <clears throat> once that is recorded or filed in those, in those property records, then for the rest of time, that HOA applies to that dirt. Um, there's legal definitions on how much dirt and what have you, but that is how HOAs get started. It starts out a plot of dirt, the HOA gets created, and then the houses get built upon it. What I have here on this slide is ye olden declarations or CCNRs. You can see how hard it is to read. I'm actually going to open this document up. It was filed in Harris County, or recorded in Harris County in 1978. <coughs> now bear with me while we wait for the computer to pull everything up. I'm going to move this document over. Now, before I start talking us through it, if one of y'all could unmute or just let me know in the chat, are y'all able to see this document? Yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Burrell. Um, so what you see here is the Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions. I'm going to call it the Declaration of a subdivision in Atascacita. Those of you who, you who are not from Houston, Atascacita is a suburb northeast of the city near Bush Airport or IAH. This subdivision got created in 1978. So one myth I want to dispel is that HOAs are brand new. They are not. I've seen HOAs as old as the 1950s. This HOA is pretty typical from when a lot of homes were built in the suburbs around the greater Houston area, built in the 70s, 80s. They're much more popular now, but they're not brand new. And the rules that control them are not brand new. And we're going to talk through all of that and how the history of HOAs really influences how they impact us today. So as you can see, this document is 23 pages long. I got my mouse circling around that. Some declarations are, you know, 60, 70, I've seen as long as 120 pages. I want to encourage all of y'all who are interested in knowing more about the powers of your HOA to go seek out the declarations. Now, <clears throat> what I'm showing you is a really old set. And, and, and when you pull it, <coughs> this information has been scanned. It's generally available online. Um, I want to show you a couple pages. It might be difficult to read, like, you know, this is an older document and scanning technology has improved, but it might not have been great when this was first scanned. Don't be scared off by the words like witnesses and witnesseth, you know, ye old in English, um, or definitions. Really skim through it to see what powers your HOA has. And if I can bring you all down, 
you know, we're seeing reservations for the powers, ex ex exceptions from the powers, and dedications. This is the power that's being dedicated to the homeowners association. What there's use and building restrictions. So this is, you know, what's popularly known as the HOA is telling me I can't paint my door pink, or I have to ask for permission before I put in a pool. Those kind of things. That's where you're going to see that power. Um, another very popular power, or one that most people know about, is HOAs can charge you either a yearly or monthly fee called a maintenance assessment. Different HOAs call them different things, but I'm going to refer to it as a maintenance assessment. This article right here talks about the covenant. Think of a covenant as a legal word for a promise. I promise to pay my maintenance assessment. And what this does, and this is the second myth I want to dispel today, is it creates a, <coughs> excuse me, a lien on the property. What does a lien mean? It means your HOA has the legal right by this contract to foreclose on your house if you do not pay your maintenance assessment. So let's take a step back there. That sounds scary, but what does it really look like? In my home that you're all in today, virtually, my annual HOA assessment is 750 bucks. If for some, and I, so I pay that annually, one year, once a year. If I don't pay that for some reason, this declaration, says that they can foreclose upon my house for $750. And to a lot of people that's mind boggling because houses cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, how can this be? It's completely legal because it's written into a contract that's recognized by Texas law. It's subject to some rules, which we will talk about, but I wanna dispel the myth that HOAs can't take my house. Most of the time, if it's written in their declarations that there's a lien, they can take your house. Now, if the HOA has a poorly drafted set of declarations, and I'm going to just jump back to the first page, if the declarations of covenants, conditions, and restrictions, or CCNRs, do not include any language in any way, shape, or form that say lien or refer to a lien or something that says we can foreclose, it's my legal opinion that they don't have that right. But you can't figure that out until you go to the paper. So let's talk about that. I just showed you the declarations for one subdivision. You might be thinking, well, how can I figure it out? How can I find it for mine? I'm curious. We're gonna talk about that. Uh, but first I wanna to get to the bylaws. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, bylaws are the rules that homeowners associations set for themselves. These are generally kind of rules on how the meetings are gonna be run, how often they're gonna be posted, things like that. Um, it's important to know these things if you're interested in getting involved with your HOA, either you're having a problem with them or maybe you're interested in running. You want to know what you're getting into. The more, you know, if you know what the speed limit is on the freeways and so on and so forth, you're a better driver. If you know what rules the HOA has to follow, you can speak their language and get more things done. So if you're looking for the bylaws or even the covenants for your HOA, I encourage you to just Google the name of your subdivision. So what I'm showing you here is the subdivision Atascacita South. This is actually a, a print screen from their website. And Atascacita South, if you may recall, is the same subdivision where I just showed you their 23 page declaration. When I was working with a client in Atascacita South, the first step I did <coughs> was Google the name of the subdivision. And lo and behold, they had a documents tab on their website. And in there I could find the bylaws, the Articles of Incorporation and the CCNRs of the Covenant, Conditions, and Restrictions. Now, that was great. Not all HOAs are created this way. Um, if you're not able to find your declarations or bylaws, contact your HOA. They have to make that information publicly available. They might charge you a, a, a copy fee of, you know, I think it's 10 to 15 cents per page. Or you can go online um, if your county puts its deed records online, which most do. Um, and you can search for the, 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 um, the declarations online. Now, is it the easiest thing to do? No, unfortunately it's not, but I'm giving you three sources on where you can find this information. First, Google it, right? You'll find the website if there is one. Some, some HOAs have one, some don't. Uh, second, ask. The HOA has to provide it to you. Um, and third, <coughs> you can go through the deed records. They're more difficult to find, um, but they are publicly available. Um, all right, so I did see that message in the chat and um, I will address your question towards the end of the presentation. 
So let's talk about community rules and regulations. As I kind of previewed earlier, what are community rules and regulations, right? We've talked about two sets of rules for HOAs, the covenants that give them their powers and the restrictions for homeowners, the bylaws that say what rules the HOAs are going to follow during their meetings and, and, and um, how they're going to govern themselves as a nonprofit corporation. How many more rules do they need? Well, it depends on the community. You could live in a subdivision that doesn't need community rules and regulations, but most have some sort of amenities or public facilities that um, they need. You, know, you need rules so people know um, how to govern themselves. What you know, who can ask for the pavilion, who can access the pool, who can rent the clubhouse, who can you know, you know how what hours can you access the tennis uh, the, te the tennis court. So as I put here on the slide, HOAs can go a step further in managing the facilities, activities, and business of the community for the current and long-term benefit of all homeowners by enacting community rules and regulations. Again, fancy lawyer language. I apologize. I can't get it out of my brain. Um, that says they can set rules so that people know, you know essentially what rules to follow. But remember, these things are not you know, carved in stone tablets. These are created by elected members who are generally your neighbors who are doing the best they can and so if you disagree with rules or regulations or what have you by all means get involved with your homeowners association it's another form of community service in my mind what a segue right who makes up hoa boards well anyone who lives in the subdivision so <clears throat> HOA boards are often initially made up of people who are appointed by the property developer. That's what I, the, the point I'm making here on the left side of the slide. Now I want to take a step back. You might be thinking, Amir, you just told me like three times that these people are elected. You're right, they are. But who elects people to the HOA board when the HOA is brand new and there's no houses and there's no neighbors? Remember, HOAs get started as a contract that's attached to a bunch of dirt, no houses. So who makes the decision? Well, it's the developer, the, the person who's gonna build the houses or build the condo, <clears throat> the condominium development. The developer owns all the land. And so it's the only one with the rights to vote or appoint HOA, uh, HOA um, board members. Now, generally what happens is as houses get built, generally when you get to about 50% of the neighborhood or 50% of the condominium development, built out and people move in, then the declarations provide that uh, elections have to happen. And that's when you really have more representative um, uh, governance of the HOA where your neighbors um, and friends, if they all live in the same subdivision, start getting elected to the board to govern itself. And, and this is again, where you can find these rules in the declarations or the bylaws um, that tell you when those criteria are met to move from appointed HOA board members to elected HOA board members. Now, uh, as I like to say, people don't talk about their HOAs generally in a kind way. Um, most people think about HOA and think about problems, but I wanna remind everyone that elected HOA boards are made up of community-minded volunteers who are neighbors that live in the same community. So these might be people that you live next door to. If you live in a condominium, maybe live on the floor above or fourth floor below, or you know you share a wall with because they live right next door. <clears throat> or it could be somebody who lives a couple streets down, but in the same subdivision. These are all community-minded individuals who, in theory, are doing the best they can. I mean, it, I, I'm an optimistic person. I like to think about the best in people, and. You know, I don't see the point in running for a volunteer organization unless you are a community-minded person. So what do HOA boards do? Whatever is allowed under Texas law, how's that? Um, with some restrictions, there are rules that say what HOA boards can do, but generally the law of Texas is corporations can do whatever they are legally, whatever they are legally allowed to do. And remember, HOAs are nonprofit corporations. Um, with the restrictions of if the declarations say the HOA cannot do this, then the HOA can't do it. If the HOA has created bylaws that say we're going to do things this way, the HOA has to follow those rules. If there are um, 
additional rules and regulations that the HOA creates for itself, it has to follow those rules. If it doesn't, you get a lawyer involved, it's going to be a hard, you're going to have a hard way, uh, the HOA is going to have a hard time saying uh, what we did is legally valid. If you're not consistent and if you're not following the rules that are set for you, that sometimes you set yourself, very difficult position to be in. Texas law dictates <coughs> the minimum number of HOA board meetings, which is where the business of HOAs are done, um, have to be handled. Um, more often than not, HOAs have to just have one meeting a year. Most corporations have to have one meeting a year, and HOAs as nonprofits are no different. So I have just talked to you about how HOAs get created. They're a contract that gets attached to some dirt. Um, eventually houses get built, then people, houses or, or, or a condo get built, and then people get voted in to the HOA and the board gets fleshed out and that board in theory governs itself. What often happens is there's another level of um, governance and that's an HOA again, made up of your volunteer neighbors who might be doing the best they can, but they probably have kids, they probably have a job. They generally hire a professional management company. So this is a third party that works for the HOA board to keep the books, to send out notices, to hire the lifeguards for the pool, to make sure the lights at the, the tennis court get fixed. Can you guys tell there's a pool and tennis court at my subdivision? That's literally all my examples, I'm done. Um, to make sure that the jogging trails get um, clean, to make sure that you know the drains stay fleshed up. Management companies can be great assets to HOAs um, so that the volunteers don't get backlogged with important work that needs to be done in the, in the subdivision. But, oh, and, and before I go to the but, um, the management company will more than likely be the primary point of contact for most homeowners, whether it's a subdivision HOA where you have your traditional houses in the suburbs, um, or it's a condominium HOA where you're either sharing walls with somebody or you're in a tower. Um, <clears throat> the but is, oh, sorry, I jumped forward. The but is you are one, with a management company, you are one more level removed from your neighbors on the board. And so it can seem very impersonal, just business, even though it's impacting the place where you lay your head at night and the family sleeps. And honestly, in my practice, management companies are where most homeowners have miscommunication, issues, complaints, concerns, what have you. And so I, I, take, I took all this time, this 45 minutes or so, to explain how HOAs get created and then say, on top of that, management companies exist so that y'all know if there's a management company involved, you do have the right to go around them and contact your neighbor who just so happens to be the HOA board president. Um, and it's, it, it's entirely likely that there might've been some miscommunication. Just like, you know, just like in any kind of business, it's hard to find good people. Management companies are looking for people. Some management companies are better than others. If you're having issues, know that there are multiple level, levels involved. Don't get discouraged if you're having problems with your HOA. Try to reach out to the board directly if you're having problems talk, working through whatever management company might have been communicating with you on their behalf. You're not just stuck in the lane they put you in. More HOAs are coming. As I mentioned, these are, you know, HOAs are a relatively recent phenomenon. By recent, I mean like from since the 1950s rather than like zero BC. Um, but more and more HOAs, or HOAs are becoming more and more popular. HOAs are actually expected to form the majority of um, subdivisions and what have you by 2040. And just, you know, looking at the date, that's, you know, less than 18 years from now. So um, that's a generation. Keep that in mind. Now, if, if you can't read this slide, I apologize. I encourage you guys to you know, pause the, the, the live presentation on the, on the recorded version online at a later date. What I have here is 2021 census data that backs up that statement that I just shared with you, that, which is that HOAs are becoming more popular and they will be the majority of way, uh, way of how houses are built or controlled by 2040. This data looks at um, housing <clears throat> new homes built from 2009 to 2019. And what it shows is that in 2009, 46% of all new homes were built in subdivisions or condos with an, with an HOA. 
But by 2019, it was 62%. So in just 10 years, you have a 10%, no, a 16% increase in the number of homes that are built in a, in a subdivision or condo subject to an HOA. Similarly, um, the, the data for new single family homes that are sold um, jumped, you know, showed a similar increase from 2009, 62% of homes that were sold. So this is not just built, but, you know, sold in a, in a maybe in a part of, part of a part of the city or part of the county that maybe didn't have an HOA before, but one was created uh, later. 62% um, of homes in 2009 were subject to an HOA, and then it's jumped to 75% of homes are being subject to an HOA. So I want to give those of you in Houston a very local example. You Maybe you live inside 610 or maybe inside Beltway 8. Those are our two inner loops, those of you who ain't from Houston. And um, you've noticed in older neighborhoods, maybe in the Heights, maybe in Montrose, bungalows getting torn down and then like six townhomes getting built, right? The bungalow, when it was built, there was no HOA. The homeowner or the property owner did not have anybody to answer to. But once they sold their land to a developer who built six townhomes, the developer created an HOA just for that plot of land. And those six townhomes or whatever, you know, the three-story things that just shoot straight up, they are now subject to an HOA. That really fleshes out the, the data that is um, on this slide. So it's not a, it, it is a brand new home, but it's not, um, uh, there was, it, it's not talking about land that had no, no building on it previously. I hope that makes sense. So let's talk about some common issues with HOAs. I know I've teased a few, but I, I want to go into some common examples. So those of you who subscribe to the Houston Chronicle may have seen this headline in July. A couple in Cyprus was sued for up to $250,000 by their homeowners association for feeding the ducks. You know, just as an aside, I told my in-laws to stop feeding the ducks in their subdivision. Um, now they could potentially lose their home. I provided the link here, but if you just Google Cypress couple, HOA, lawsuit, Houston, you'll find it. In Pearland, another suburb of the greater Houston area, ducks overran an HOA and the HOA actually started encouraging homeowners to shoot them and told people to stop feeding them. Otherwise they would face you know, the threat of enforcement actions from their homeowners association. Those are some common issues. Apparently, you shouldn't feed the ducks anywhere. Um, but I illustrate that to bring a point of levity to some of the common complaints that people have with their homeowners association. I don't like you know, anybody telling me what to do with my property. Well, if you read the contract when you bought your house, you might be giving away some of your rights and control over what you can and cannot do on your plot of dirt or your square if you live in a HF condo tower, um, when, you, when, when you moved in. You know, there's all, everything in life is a give and a take. And if you wanna, you know, take some space up in a certain neighborhood, you might have be given up some rights to be there. So other common issues, there's general dysfunction in and mismanagement of HOAs. This is, this is not to disparage anybody here who might be on an HOA board. There's good ones and there's bad ones, just like there's anything in life. Uh, debt collection activity, Anytime someone's trying to squeeze somebody else for money, there's going to be hard feelings. Um, and coercive settlement. Um, and I'll talk about all of these things in a much more detail as we go through these slides. Um, additional um, um, issues and abusive practices is lots of paperwork. So if you ever get sideways with your HOA, you'll know because the paperwork just co starts coming fast and furious. It can involve legal demand letters, letters from law firms, documents from the court, law firms saying you have to produce X, Y, and Z documents called discovery. Uh, it can be very, very overwhelming. And expenses that can increase very quickly, including attorney's fees that the HOA has hired a law firm to do debt collection. And maybe your $750 debt then balloons to $5,000 in a the, in the matter of you know, a year. And you're wondering how can anything grow that quickly? So disputes with HOAs often turn nasty for a point I made earlier. This is your home. This is where people go at the end of the day to find peace, to lay your head at night, to put your kids to bed, 
to keep your, you know, your fur babies safe. That's where you have your, your, your plot of dirt that is yours. It's natural to feel strongly. It's natural to have, you know, for, for an HOA telling you what to do for that to create bad blood. I hope that <clears throat> if you take nothing else from this presentation, understanding how HOAs are created, how the history of them and the organization of them can inform you on how they work, can help you better speak the language to have better interactions with your homeowners association. The most common issue that homeowners have with their HOAs is falling behind on their maintenance assessments. So jumping back, I, when I showed you guys the, the, the CCNRs or the declarations, I highlighted the portion where the HOA said, anyone who buys in this neighborhood or buys in this subdivision has to pay an annual maintenance assessment or we can foreclose on your house. You can see how that threat of foreclosure can create bad blood and a lot of mis misinformation where you think, I only owe you 500 bucks a year. There's no way you can take my $300,000 house. Yes, you can. And that is a common misconception that leads to one of the, to the most common issue with homeowners associations when you fall behind or maybe just neglect to pay because you didn't know. Um, going to HOA <clears throat> mismanagement, so talking about a case study in abuse by an HOA board in Houston, the board of a condo owners association may have been abusing its powers and in the process forced out fellow organizations. Notice I said may, right? No judge or anyone has said they actually did, but you know, when you review this article, again, just Google the headline, Houston condo owners sued their HOA board after foreclosures, a big assessment and issues, but state law gives them few options. You can review this article from the Houston Chronicle and you can draw your own conclusion. In this case, in which I'm quoted, um, several, many condo owners found that their HO, their condo owner board or their HOA board was just indiscriminately raising their, their monthly maintenance assessments. And condos are a little different than what most people think about with um, subdivision HOA. So the subdivision HOA, like where I live, you have a house, it's on dirt, it's separated by like 12 feet from the house next to you and you pay one fee to your HOA annually. In condos, generally you pay a fee to your HOA monthly, and it might be, you know, 100 bucks a month, 200 bucks a month. Um, in these case, but, but it's subject to being raised by the HOA board. Again, the HOA governs itself. And so in this situation, these homeowners felt like the HOA board members in voting for these increases over and over and over again were for, forcing out more uh, lower income people who maybe lived on fixed incomes or were disabled and unable to keep up with those assessments. And what happens when you don't pay your assessments? The HOA can start the foreclosure process and take your home. <clears throat> so I wanna talk about that process. HOA led foreclosures and if a foreclosure happens, HOA led evictions. So as I mentioned to you guys earlier, HOAs, your homeowners association, if you live somewhere subject to one, probably has a lien against your home. I'd say 95% of the, the HOA cases I've handled, the, the, the association actually has a lien. In very, very few circumstances, they do not. Um, and that lien allows it to enforce its rules, controlling your behavior and, and your obligation to pay your maintenance assessment by threatening to foreclose on your house. Now, I want you to think, when you think of foreclosure, just think this is just another form of debt collection, right? They're sending you letters saying, pay the bill. They're filing a lawsuit against you saying the bill, pay, saying pay the bill. They got a court order that says, if you don't pay the bill, we're going to take your house. That's it, right? Foreclosure, big, scary word, but think of it as just pay your bill. Otherwise, we're going to take your house. HOAs most likely can foreclose on your home and sell it at a public auction if you get sideways with them. Now, Texas law is clear on this point. HOAs can charge a bunch of different fines, fees, whatever, but if you don't pay your maintenance assessment, and I'm using those words for a very important reason, your maintenance assessment, whether it's a condo and you pay this monthly, or it's a subdivision house and you pay this annually, if you don't pay that maintenance assessment, then the HOA can foreclose. If you paint your house pink and you violate the HOA rules, they can fine you, but they cannot foreclose for fines. 
if you don't cut your grass and the HOA sends you letters saying cut your grass, they can fine you, but they cannot foreclose on your house. If you have a broken down, busted car in the front yard or the driveway and the HOA says the rules say move it, they can fine you. But more than likely, they cannot foreclose on your home. That uh, Cypress couple that I mentioned that uh, a few slides previously who's facing the loss of their home for feeding the ducks, their HOA is very, very unique. Most homeowners associations do not have the right to take your house because you've done some sort of um, rule violation that's not related to not paying your assessments, your, ma your maintenance assessments. In their case, it was an HOA rule, don't feed the ducks. In their situation, their HOA covenants, their specific contracts that if you violate any rule, we can fine you and that fine is attached to the lien. The lien meaning they can foreclose. Very specific situation, but I want to just if you take nothing from what I just said for the last few minutes, pay your maintenance assessments, otherwise your HOA can take your house. Now, how do foreclosures in Texas work generally? So I'm going to I'm going to start talking about mortgage foreclosures, and I'm going to come back to HOAs very briefly on mortgage foreclosures because I want to make the distinction so that there's no misinformation or myths floating out there. <clears throat> Texas is what's called a non-judicial foreclosure state. That means I don't got to go to, if, I, if I'm a mortgage company, I don't got to go to court and get a court order that says I can foreclose on your house. Uh, if you don't pay your mortgage in Texas, I'm not talking about home equity loans or reverse mortgages. I'm talking about the mortgage you use to buy your house. Your mortgage company can generally foreclose on your house by sending you two certified letters saying, just pay this bill. You got 30 days. If you didn't pay the bill, here's a second letter. Now we're going to sell your house in 21 days. Um, and your house is set for the first four, first Tuesday in the month, um, and it's going to be sold at a public auction on that Tuesday. Non-judicial foreclosure sales are set for October to happen next Tuesday. It's the first Tuesday of October. Those don't, that rule applies to only mortgages. That's a vast majority of foreclosures, foreclosures but it's, that's, those rules are only for mortgages. I share that to make the distinction that <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. This is where I'm fleshing out the two letters that have to be sent. Um, I share that to make the distinction between what HOAs can do. For homeowners who live in subdivisions, again, a traditional house in the suburbs or maybe in you know the inner city that you don't share a wall with another building, that's not legally considered a condo. So your building is separate. They have the HOA has to file a lawsuit against you in order to get a court order to foreclose. That's a judicial foreclosure. Some condos have the power to follow the non-judicial foreclosure process, which is you fall behind on your bill, your maintenance assessment, they send you a couple of letters, and then they schedule you for a foreclosure auction without a court being involved. So I, I got ahead of myself when I was saying all the things HOAs cannot foreclose on, but I want to emphasize these right here. You cannot be foreclosed on for any violation that is not related to your, your maintenance assessment. So let's detail a few. Not paying fines related to trash pickup. So today's trash day in my neighborhood. If I forget to go get the trash can for a week or so, HOA is going to send me a letter, might find me. They can't foreclose on my house for that fine, to collect that fine. Uh, if I painted my house a color that's not allowed under the HOA rules or not approved by the HOA, they can find me. They can't take my house. If I had a, if my car is broken down and I don't move it and the inspection expires, they can, the HOA can find me, but they cannot foreclose on me and take my house. If my roof, you know, is 15, 20 years old, been hit by hail damage, got holes in it, you know, big blue tarp on it from, from a hurricane. Um, I don't fix it. HOA can send me a letter, find me, but they cannot foreclose on my house. You can think of a number of other examples that fit here. But the general rule is in a vast majority of situations, HOAs can only foreclose and take your house if you don't pay your maintenance assessments. So pay your mortgages, pay your taxes, pay your, pay your assessments. So you y'all have heard me talk about two different types of HOAs. What I've tried to do here was visually uh, depict them. So on the left side, for those of you who may not be able to see from you know maybe calling in or visually impaired, I have a picture of what people consider a typical suburban neighborhood. It's a bunch of homes, all separated by different yards and fences. Some have pools in the backyard. But the key, to, key feature here to keep in mind is none of these homes, 
you know, you might have home A and home B, they do not share walls, they're not connected. The reason I make that distinction is if you look on the right side of the slide, condos are legally distinct because you are selling someone a box that they get to own, but it's, it, has, it, it shares a wall with another box that someone else owns. Most people think of condo towers. You know, you think of a 50 story tower in downtown Houston or New York City, and that's condos. Those are condos. But any of, any of y'all who are from Houston, I encourage you to go down, you know, um, 59 and exit this and that and drive around. You're gonna see a lot of two and three story buildings that look like apartments, you know, right off of 59 and this and that, either east or west. But I guarantee you, most of those are condos. There's apartments that were built in the 70s, with the oil bus, those apartment complexes went in, you know, went out of business. So the owners started selling off different, they converted them to condos and started selling off different units to different owners. A lot of people looking for affordable housing go buy condos that look just like that. So on the right side of the slide, you will see what a lot of people would consider walk ups. Uh, these are houses where you can literally walk up to the front door, but you're sharing a wall with someone else. That's a condo. Reason I make that distinction is because the collection process, the foreclosure process for subdivision houses where you don't share a wall versus condos where you do share a wall or maybe a roof or a floor um, or a back wall um, are different under Texas law. So I'm gonna go through those. For subdivisions, an HOA, before it can collect from for past for unpaid maintenance assessments, remember only maintenance assessments, has to send a pre-collection letter informing the homeowner that they owe this maintenance assessment debt 40, and, and give them 45 days to fix it, right? You're behind $750. Here's, you got, you got to pay it within 745 uh, days. If you don't, these bad things will happen to you. And assuming you don't pay the debt, after that, if the HOA wants to take things to the next level to try and collect, they must file a lawsuit um in the county where the property is located and ask for a court order that allows them to foreclose and once the judge signs that order then the hoa has to send you a letter saying we have scheduled your home to be sold at a foreclosure auction on the first tuesday of the month uh, that letter has to be put in the mail 21 days in advance of that first tuesday so thinking back to next tuesday october the 4th being foreclosure tuesday those letters letting people know that the HOA is going to sell their house had to be sent <coughs> about three weeks prior or mid-September. Um, that's the process for, that's the judicial foreclosure process for homeowners associations that govern subdivisions. Again, houses that don't share walls. The foreclosure process that governs how condo owner associations or where your homes share walls or roofs or floors with others um, are a little different. Some condo, asso condo owner associations impose upon themselves in their declaration the, 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 the obligation to follow the, the judicial foreclosure process. But Texas law gives condo owners associations the right to foreclose merely by following the non-judicial foreclosure process. I'm gonna briefly recap that. They only have to send two letters via certified mail, and then schedule your condo for auction. First letter has to be a notice of default. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, you have not paid your assessments in one month, two months, three months. This is $600. If you do not pay it in the next 30 days, we will then schedule your home to be sold at a foreclosure auction. 30 days goes by. Second letter comes, certified mail. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, we previously gave you a 30-day notice saying you needed to pay 600 bucks. You did not. Now we've scheduled your home to be sold at the foreclosure auction, which will be held on the first Tuesday in November. And that gives you like literally the last opportunity to try and pay off the debt and stop the foreclosure sale of your home. What I want to make clear is in that non-judicial process, while the letter has to be sent by certified mail, that is just to prove that it was sent to the correct address. Texas law does not require your homeowners association to prove that you actually received the letter. So if you've never received certified mail, this is generally when a, a, a postal service uh, employee will knock on your door and say, I have a letter for you to sign. If you're not home, most of the time, the postal service employee will either 
leave a little sticky note on your door or put one in your mailbox saying, we have a letter for you at the post office, come pick it up. I highly, highly encourage you to go do that. I know life happens. I got two kids. Um, sometimes a couple of days can go by, but if you have certified mail, go check it out. I'm not saying it's a HOA threatening to foreclose on you, but people don't send certified mail unless it's important. It's like $7 a letter. So it's not cheap. I just, I want to encourage anybody who gets certified mail to check it out. So let's say worst case scenario happens, either condo or subdivision that you, uh, uh, subdivision style house that you own has been foreclosed upon and sold at a public auction. What now? Now you under Texas law have a right to get your house back. This is called the right to redeem after foreclosure. Now there are two different timelines. Again, going back to that, that split between subdivisions and condos. I'm going to talk about subdivisions, then I'll talk about condos. If you have a home that has been foreclosed upon that is in a subdivision, remember you don't share walls with anybody else, you got 180 days, generally 180 days from the foreclosure auction to get your property back, give or take a few days. There's a special notice that has to be posted. And once that notice is posted, then the 180 days starts ticking. I'm not trying to bore you with the legalese. Just know, let's use October the 4th as an example. Add 180 days to October the 4th. If you have not tried to redeem your property, you have no legal right to demand it come back. And the process of redeeming is basically the same. So I'll explain that after I explain the, the condo process. <clears throat> For condos, what you'll see is they have a lot less protections than homeowners in subdivisions. The condos, you have 90 days from the foreclosure auction. Foreclosure sales held on October the 4th, add 90 days on day 91, condo owner, you have no right to demand your house be given back to you. So when I say right to redeem, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the right to buy back your house. So if your $200,000 house or your $80,000 condo was auctioned off for $1,000 in HOA debt and attorney's fees, and at the auction started a thousand bucks, but the public auction, people came, it got bid up to $30,000. What's going to happen is you have this period of time, whether it's 90 to 180 days, to pay that $30,000 back to, to whomever bought your house, this, whether it's the HOA who bought your house or a third party. Remember, it's a public auction. Anyone can come. And once you pay them off, then you get title to that. You get the deed title back in your name. Now you might be thinking, well, well dang, I fell behind a thousand bucks. Where's my, where am I going to come up with 30,000? Again, in my example, here's, here's what happens. If your property is disposed of or sold or, and you owed a thousand bucks and the bid was 30,000 out of that $30,000 bid, a thousand is going to go pay off your HOA. The remaining 29,000 belongs to you and should be given to you by law by the homeowners association or the sheriff that conducted the foreclosure auction. You can then use that money and get some more, whether through friends, family, or just working, um, to come up with the amount of money necessary to redeem your property. Now, in my line of work, it's rare, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. These legal rights exist so that you know if the foreclosure process comes down on you, you're not at the end of the road. You have somewhere between 90 and 180 days, depending on what kind of property you have, to get your house back. So I want to talk briefly about post foreclosure eviction. A post foreclosure eviction is just like any other eviction. It is someone claiming to be the new owner of your home, condo or subdivision style home, and saying, you're a tenant, get out. It's the same as if you were being, you know, facing eviction from an apartment complex. It's literally the same legal process. Now, if your house is foreclosed upon, I'm going to just use October 4th because it's next week. On October the 5th, the new owner of your property, it might be the HOA. They might have been the highest bidder at the auction. It might be Joe Schmo from down the street who, who's, a, who's a real estate investor who goes to these auctions looking for deals. Um, whomever it is, is the new legal owner of your property. <clears throat> they can start the eviction process the next day as long as they have the documents to prove that they're the new owner. The hard part about this is you might be thinking, I'm going to jump back a slide. Well, Amir, you just told me <clears throat> after the foreclosure auction, I got the right to redeem. And if I'm in a condo, I got 90 days. If I'm in a subdivision house, I got 180 days. You're absolutely right. Nothing I just said about evictions changes that. The hard part here is 
your right to redeem runs for that 90 to 180 days, but the eviction process can start immediately. So you could be, <clears throat> in theory, legally evicted from your home while still having a time period to redeem your home. And it makes it doubly hard when you fell behind on a debt, you lost your house, you were kicked out of your house. Now you're having to come up with all the money to get it back and pay for new housing expenses, you know, AKA rent or what have you to, for you and your family and all your stuff. It's a very, very difficult position to be in, and which is why while redeeming your property and getting title back or the deed back is a legal right, it is practically very, very difficult to exercise that right. So what I encourage all people here listening is if you or a friend or family member or just somebody you know down the street is dealing with an HOA foreclosure, try and get that thing resolved before the foreclosure auction happens because it's a lot harder to stay in your house once the house is sold, even though you have the right to get it back. It's just practically very, very difficult and expensive. <clears throat> that, I wanna take you in more detail on how quickly these, these evictions can um, happen. And these are, again, this is the same process for any kind of eviction, whether it's from an apartment that's being rented, a house that's being rented, or after a foreclosure auction. In all situations, people in any one of those three scenarios I just described, you're a tenant. And if the landlord doesn't want you there or the owner doesn't want you there, they have to give you a three-day notice to vacate. That's a piece of paper. It doesn't need to look any certain kind of way. That's to say, you got three days, get out. That's it. Now, there's certain ways that it has to be delivered to you, and I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, but on day four, if the person who, the former owner of the property has not vacated or left, the new owner of the property can then go to your local justice of the peace court or JP court and file an eviction lawsuit where they're seeking a court order, <coughs> excuse me, a court order from a judge or a jury to say, you gotta get out. And these timelines can work very quickly. So three day notice to vacate on day four, the lawsuits filed. Generally, you have a court date within 10 to 14 calendar days. So you're really looking at you know foreclosure happening, notice of AK getting posted, eviction lawsuit being filed within three weeks. Now I've never seen that timeline work out that quickly, but legally that is the process that could happen. Um, and you can see how this process can be just that much more challenging to someone who's in financial distress. So let's talk about options to alleviate that financial distress. <clears throat> Again. I'm an optimistic person. I try to find the positive or the silver lining. I'm trying to leave you all with that here today. The Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund is a large pot of millions of dollars from the state of Texas given by the feds, the federal government, um, to help homeowners who are struggling with homeownership debt, including HOA debt, pay those debts so they can keep their homes. So as I mentioned previously, the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund can, gives out grants that can pay mortgage debt, tax debt, insurance debt, or HOA debt. <clears throat> the website for the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund is www.texashomeownersassistance.com. The phone number is 1-833-651-3874. Now, <clears throat> you must meet the income and uh, income eligibility and other requirements. You basically have to prove that you fall under a certain income level. It's 100% AMI, which is area median income. Now, you might not know what that number is, and I'm not sharing that number because it's different depending on what area you live in. If you live in the greater Houston area, that number is a certain number. If you live out in, <clears throat> in Waco, that number is different. If you live in you know, El Paso, that number is different. The great thing about the website, again, texashomeownersassistance.com, is there are links to calculators for you to punch in your zip code, the size of your house and how much your gross income is. And it will tell you if you fall underneath that cap. So it's a one-stop shop for you to figure out if you're eligible. <clears throat> if you figure out that you are eligible, this program offers these grants um, to be able to help you pay the debts that you may have fallen behind on. And this program is designed, um, this is the, the homepage that I'm showing on, on the website. This program was designed to help people who've been financially impacted by the pandemic. And I just want to you know, do a little PSA here. If you bought a mask, you've been financially impacted by the pandemic. Don't overthink it. 
Um, <clears throat> the program looks to see if you're eligible, two eligibility criteria, one or three. One, are you 100% AMI, area median income? Two, have you been financially impacted by the pandemic? So that means you had to have some financial impact after January 20th, I'm sorry, January 21st of 2020. That's when uh, the presidential disaster declaration about the COVID-19 pandemic was made. And third, you have to have some kind of home ownership debt, HOA debt, property taxes, mortgage or insurance. Now, I just went through those points without having the PowerPoint slide up. Um, <clears throat> if you go through this checklist that, uh, that I have on the slide, you will see that um, it talks about the date, January 21st, 2020, um, and additional program requirements will apply. What that means is you've got to provide proof of the debt and proof that you live in your house. So for my clients who have helped navigate this process, <clears throat> what they generally have to provide is an ID. You know, you want to have your address on the ID match the address of the house that you're trying to save. And you got to have a recent utility bill, water bill, gas bill, and uh, light bill, any other kind of utility that I can't quite think of right now. And then you have to have the bill from the mortgage company or the bill from the HOA or the property tax bill that shows I'm behind on this debt. <clears throat> the application process takes probably 30 minutes if you have all your documents, your ducks in a row. Um, you again, fill it out online. If you don't have access to a computer, but you have the documents, you can call the 1-800 number and the staff there will help you navigate the process, uh, send you paperwork that you can mail back. This program is meant to be inclusive no matter what your technology access uh, restrictions might be. Um, in addition, there are in-person intake centers that are getting set up. I don't have the addresses of those available just yet, but they will be added to the website or you can call the 1-800 number to be able to find your local intake center. Again, if you're more comfortable working with people in person. The website, again, I'm gonna keep repeating this so that everyone knows because it's a very powerful tool. TexasHomeownersAssistance.com and the 1-800 number is 833-651-3874. So we just talked about what are HOAs? How do they get created? Where are their powers from? What can they do? <clears throat> what, what does the foreclosure process look like? What happens after foreclosure if an HOA tries to foreclose upon you? And tools from the Texas Homeowners Assistance Fund to head off foreclosure. It is 2.22. I am happy to take some questions. I see some messages in the chat. I'm just gonna skim through here. I'm going to read out the questions for the recording. So um, Ms. Dominici, and I hope I said your name right, um, says, I'm the community manager of an HOA in Houston. This is great information that all of our and all of our residents could benefit. May I share this presentation when the link is forwarded to me? Thank you. And then she lists her name and the organization. Absolutely. It's my understanding from Ms. Murray and Ms. Hippolyte that the recording has been, I believe this has been recorded. It's available on the Facebook page of the uh, Neighborhood Recovery, <clears throat> excuse me, Neighborhood Recovery Center, and will be shared after after that. Uh, Nia, I saw you, you come on the screen. Was there anything you wanted to supplement? No, um, I, I was just going to pretty much say the same thing that, that was in the chat, so you can go right ahead. But um, uh, the recording will be shared with everyone. Uh, if anyone in the meantime, I, if they don't want to wait for the recording, you can also go to our uh, Amos Houston TX Facebook page and uh, and watch the recording since it's being uh, sent live there also. Thank you. Thank you, Nia. Um, now, Claudia Autry, I see you asked a similar question. Uh, you know, I think Nia and I have already answered that. So I apologize. You know, I hope you don't get offended if I don't, ask, you know, read out your question and then answer it. Um, I see uh, Ms. Murray asked, is there a limit on the amount of the fine they can charge? So um, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> um, I know it's a, a typical lawyer answer, but when you're trying to figure out what the limit is, you got to figure out what rules the HOA has to follow. And so you're going to want to look at the covenants or the, the, the CC&Rs or the declarations. It's the same thing. And it'll say, you know, this is the interest rate or the late fee. These are the penalties. Um, and this is the, 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 the collection process. 
that's really where you're going to figure out what kind of uh, route, you know, limits might exist. The HOA has created for itself to charge. That And that includes like if it's a fine for a fence or trash or whatever it is that they may uh, uh, be assessing a fine for? Yes and no. So the declarations are going to say, you know, it, it, you know, if they have, if they can charge fines, maybe how much they can charge. That also might be listed in the bylaws. Um, okay. I can tell you there's a, a, a very specific Texas law that a lot of HOA attorneys cite to, which says if your fence is busted, if you don't move the broken car or any of the things you just described, we can charge you up to $200 a day until you fix it. I want to remind everyone that just because an HOA says they can charge it doesn't mean that they have convinced the judge that that amount of money is right or legal. It's not the HOA's word is not the word of God, to put it in more biblical terms. Um, and if you are fined under that law, 200 bucks a day, remember that is not your maintenance assessment. And so the HOA more than likely, like I'm highly, highly confident in this, more than likely cannot foreclose upon your home just to get, just to collect, just to sell your house, to pay that fine. But can they attach a lien for the fine? So in case you go to sell the property and you have these fines now that you have not paid over a period of time for however long, then can, are they allowed to do that? The short answer is no, with a caveat. So in Texas, the only types, there's only certain types of debts that can have that can have a lien on your property. I'm not going to go into those, but if if a, if a credit card company sues you or a, um, a medical provider sues you or an HOA sues you for fines, they can take you to court. And if they win, they get a judgment. And there's a collection process under Texas law where they can do what's called abstract that judgment. It basically means they file a copy of that judgment saying you owe X amount of dollars in the deed records. And what people often think is when they see an abstract of judgment, that is a lien. Legally, that is not a lien. It, it, there's a process where you can actually remove that abstract from your homestead and not have to pay the debt. Now, if you don't follow that process and you go to sell your house, I guarantee you the buyer is going to say, well, what's going on with this? And the title company who might be involved in that sale might say, hey, fix this. And, and part of the fix, they might say, is just throw money at it and, and, and force you to pay it. If you're ever in one of those situations, I highly encourage you to consult with an experienced real estate attorney. To, to help you resolve the matter. And I, I'm sorry, I glanced down because I just saw another question pop in the chat. But before I did that, uh, Nia, did I answer your question? Yeah, that was a question that somebody sent me directly. So okay. I just wanted to make sure that it get, it, it got answered. Uh, well, I guess as a follow up to that, can can you be fined every month for the same infraction? Yes, um, more than likely, yes. And, and I'm sorry to keep caveating my questions, but remember this is legal information rather than legal advice. Legal advice being, this is your specific situation and this is how the law applies. Legal information is generally Texas law says an HOA can fine you daily maximum $200 a day for the same infraction. For example, I'm working with a, 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 a couple um, outside the greater Houston area where they have a broken down boat in the front yard, the grass isn't cut and they got mildew grown on the side of the house and the HOA filed the lawsuit and is seeking a court order that says we get to find them every single day that they haven't removed the boat, pressure washed the mildew, or cut the grass. And it, so it's not a monthly thing, it's really a daily thing. Now, some HOAs will dial it back and try to find you monthly. Um, that's their right, but they can also do it. They could also seek a court order to say you're, you have to pay a fine daily. Um, I, again, I wanna reiterate that any of these talk about fines, are not secured by a lien, meaning the HOA cannot foreclose on your house to force the sale to pay the fine. That's only for maintenance assessments. Okay, I have another follow-up too, but I saw Ms. Burrell, uh, you unmuted yourself a little while ago. Was there a question that you had? No, it was an accident, I'm sorry. Okay, all right, no problem. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, but in the meantime, if anybody else does have another question, because I'm, I'm going to kind of ramble as stuff is kind of popping into my head here, uh, but please feel free to uh, to unmute yourself or raise your hand or what have you, uh, or if you still want to type it in the chat, please feel free to do that also. Um, I've gotten, uh, well, I've heard conversations from my neighbors with the drought that we've had and, you know, the fact that there has been no rain. 
uh, in people's lawns or not, they're, they, they don't look too well. They don't look that healthy. And you've got HOAs now that are harassing people about their grass. Can they assess fines because of the, the weather and people not wanting to incur a huge water bill to go out and water their grass? It depends. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, so I'll give you I'll give you a personal example. The part of Katy that I live in, um, the city of Katy actually said, you know, the drought got so bad, you cannot water your grass, but for on these specific days. Otherwise, we're going to fine you. In that, in my situation, I would argue, if I'm watering my grass on the two days that the city of Katy said I can and the HOA has some problems with the aesthetics on how it looks, I would tell the HOA to take a hike. Now, I'm a real estate lawyer. I'm used to advocating for people. I know it can be hard. Um, if you're in a part of the county, any county, or a part of the city that where there's not that kind of guidance from your local government, I would argue more than likely the HOA does have the power to say, you know, look, the reason this HOA was created was to make sure the subdivision looks a certain way, the houses are kept up a certain way, and the, the grass looks a certain way to help resale values. That's like literally the number one reason they exist. And they could probably fine you for, you know, not watering your grass. Water bills be damned. I, I, I know right? it's a terrible answer, but more than likely, yes, they could. Even the trees, I've, 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 one of one of my neighbors in particular has gotten uh, a letter because the the tree is is pretty much kind of dead now because it hasn't had water and they're demanding that they cut the tree. So and I know what the cost of trees to to, to be cut are. So I mean that's just if I could if I could work. piggyback on that example and then Vicky I see your question in the chat I will answer that next. Um, you know my parent I grew up closer towards Gallison. My parents live in a city called Dickinson right off mm -hmm. of 45. Uh, their HOA, I can't remember what set of rules, if it's declarations or bylaws, actually says every house has to have two trees in the front yard. Mm -hmm. um, in, if I were to piggyback on the example you were just giving me, if one of my parents' trees died, I would think the HOA would send them a letter saying, buy a new tree. You know, it could be a sapling, right? It doesn't need to be this beautiful 100-year oak tree. You know, that neighborhood that my parents live in has been there for 30 years, so it's not going to have those kind of trees. But that, that, that really goes to the level of detail that some HOAs can have in their declarations. And I want, what I wanna encourage is don't be scared of a homeowners association, right? This presentation was designed to let you know that they do have some powers, but there's, all, there's a lot of myths and misinformation out there. And I want you to be empowered by this information to know that you have the ability to do a little bit of research and push back uh, a lot of times HOAs, when, when, when they get a management company or a lawyer involved, and this is not to disparage my colleagues who do this kind of work, they speak like they're speaking with, you know, God is talking in their ear, like they can do no wrong. And I, I just use that example because I think a lot of people get it, regardless if you're agnostic or don't believe. It's, it's, it's not. It's just not. There are rules. This, this is a country of law, rules. You got to follow them. And just because the HOA says something doesn't mean it's the truth. Now, um, I see Vicky's question, follow-up question was, am I to understand that fines cannot lead to liens, but non-payments of a maintenance assessment fees will? And the short answer is yes. So most HOAs, when they are created, again, the, doc, the, the paperwork that the developer creates, the contract that says this HOA is now birthed or created, in that document, it says we have a lien on this land. We as the, the HOA have a lien on the land. So the lien is already there. And the lien is to, I'm going to use lawyer language and then put it in English, to secure the repayment of maintenance assessments and any, any interest or attorney's fees related to the collection of attorney, uh, maintenance assessments. That means the HOA is looking for the ultimate enforcement mechanism for closure to force you to pay your maintenance assessments. I have yet to come across a set of HOA declarations that says, if we fine you, or feeding the ducks or not painting or not keeping your house in good condition. We have a lien for the fine. I've yet to see that. In fact, there's a, a, a specific Texas law that says these, 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 these things, Texas not Texas property code 209.009, these things cannot be the basis of a foreclosure uh, action by an HOA in a subdivision. Not a condo. 
Um, and, and those things are fines, fees, and attorney's fees related to collecting the fines. So I, I hope that answers your question there, Vicki. Uh, there is no lien generally that, that, that obligates you to pay the fines, but there more than likely is a lien that obligates you to pay the maintenance assessment. Yes, uh, thank you. And I see another question from Robert. Does a condo president have ultimate authority or does the president need a majority of the board members to approve an action or sign a contract? More than likely, the, it, it, first off, it depends. What does the bylaw say? How does that condo board have to operate? Who has the power? Is it a more majority decision, which is most more than likely the answer? Or, or do they empower the, uh, the president to be you know, kind of a mini dictator and just do things at his or her whim? Um, I, I can't give you a specific answer. I would say it depends on what the bylaws say. Um, if it's not addressed, then you would have to look specifically at Texas law, and I'll readily admit I did not look at those laws to see what authority a, a, an HOA board, a condo board has. What I would encourage you to do is check out two sections of the Texas Property Code, Texas Property Code Chapter 81 and Texas Property Code Chapter 82. Those are all the rules for condos. Uh, condo owner association, including the rights of uh, rights and powers of boards. So if the bylaws are silent, if the declarations are silent, it's not addressed, um, as, as your follow-up question said, Robert, check out Texas Property Code 81 and 82. Now, I'll let you know, and again, this is as a lawyer, all I see are problems, right? No one, generally people don't come to lawyers when things are hunky-dory. Um, bad people are going to do bad things. I'm not saying HOAs are bad or the people that are on their boards or manage them are bad, but if someone has, you know, bad intentions, they're going to try and do something until someone stands up and says, you can't do it. I don't care what the law says, right? There's no one enforcing these laws except for individual homeowners and the lawyers or advocates that they hire or engage. Okay. There was, a. Um, I'm trying to find the link for uh, um it was during one of the other previous uh hoa presentations that we did that there was a website and i'll include it in the link when i send it or in the email when i send out the link uh it was a website that it takes you to uh like this management or or, or association website that tells you everything that uh an hoa or or condo association can and can't do and you know so on and so forth so i'll find that and i'll, I'll put it into the 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 link as well. Um, one thing I do want or have you address first, where is it that somebody can find a copy of their bylaws or how do they get a copy of their bylaws or their their deed restrictions and HOA association restrictions and so on and so forth? All that paperwork that says what an HOA can and can't do. Great question. Um, mm -hmm. so there's three places I like to look. Uh, first, I Google the name of the HOA to see if they have a website. And it, most HOAs that do have websites, they put their declarations, their collection policy, their bylaws, the rules that they have to follow on the website that are publicly available. If they don't have a website, um, the HOA has to have some contact information, whether a, a mailing address or um, a phone number. I contact the HOA and ask for a copy of the specific documents that I want. And they're going to have an office somewhere and they're going to have this paperwork somewhere and you can go there and look at it. And if you want a copy of it, they can charge you a copying fee. Now, when it comes to the, the declaration, the document that created the HOA's rights on the land, you can find that in any county deed records where the HOA is. So the part of Katy I live in is in Fort Bend County, but parts of Katy are in Harris County. And some other parts are in Waller County. If I lived in Harris County, I'd go look at the Harris County deed records for my HOA declaration uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I hope that answered your question. I saw another question pop up um, from mm -hmm. M. Foreman. Annual meeting of members versus board meeting of directors. Members are not being allowed to vote on anything or really have a say doing the meeting being virtual. What can be done? Also, the floor is never open for nomination. So I'm not trying to use this as a cop out, but it really depends on what your bylaws say. Um, if your bylaws here are silent, so the bylaws should for the HOA should be available either on the website or by contacting the HOA and asking for a copy of them. If they're not, then you're going to want to look to Texas law and consult with an experienced real estate attorney to find the specific law that says like the HOA thou shalt maintain open records. I, I can't 
give you the number off the top of my head, but it exists. Because these are nonprofit corporations, they have to keep records. Because <clears throat> you as a homeowner or a condo owner live there, you have a right to those records. Now they can charge you a copying fee, but you have a right to request it. If they're not being responsive, you can generally have to get a lawyer involved. And when people don't do what the law says, you got to get a lawyer to help you navigate that. Um, and, 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 and you might, um, you might have to file a lawsuit or send them a letter demanding, demanding access. Once you get the bylaws, you'll really know if they're following the rules or not. And if they're not, you know, an easy way, what I like to do is, you know, pick up the phone with whomever's on the board or exchange some emails saying, Hey, um, this is what you did. This is what the rules say, fix it and tell them what I want. If they ain't going to listen to file a lawsuit. And, and I, don't, I don't mean to say like, I'm a lawyer, file a lawsuit. That's my only tool. It's a tool. It's a blunt tool. It's a tool that takes some time, costs money, but um, it's the way to force the HOA to do what it is that you want them to do, or at least convince a judge that you're right under the law and the HOA is wrong. Hey, Amir, on something like that, could they go through arbitration? It depends. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought, that's like not my first reach, right? Um, if the if the the declarations and covenants the the guiding document for the HOA says all disputes have to be you know controlled through arbitration, then yes, you can go through arbitration. Um, otherwise, you can ask the HOA, "Do you want to arbitrate this?" And arbitration can be cheaper and faster than filing a lawsuit, um, but it can also be risky. You know, with with judges in Texas, our judges are elected, so they're more accountable to the people than an arbitrator is. Right, an arbitrator is a private judge, and he or she might be very, very qualified, but they're just getting paid. They're getting paid to do a job. Um, and so, if you want something to go quicker, arbitration might be an option. Um, Justice of the Peace Court, you know, those are those JP judges are elected, and generally lawsuits in JP court move faster than they would at a different level of court. Um, and you know, you might compare the filing fees of filing a lawsuit in JP court. Um, versus arbitration. So it's a great question, Myra. It just, again, I'm sorry, it depends. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, sure. There was another question that got emailed to me. I'm trying to go back to that page. Uh, in the meantime, I did put your, all of your contact information uh, into the chat. And for those folks that are joining us online uh, on Facebook, can you tell them again how to uh, get in contact with you guys? Sure, sure thing. So, um, there's two ways to contact Lone Star Legal Aid. <coughs> Excuse me. Hadn't coughed in a while, so why not? Um, you can contact us Monday through Friday between 8 and 5 by calling us at 713-652-0077. Or you can contact us 24 hours a day by checking out our website, which is www.lonestarlegal.org. Um, and on our website, there is a link for you to be able to apply if you're looking to apply for services. If you're just looking for more legal information, we have all of that organized in, a, in great ways by our communications team on our website. It's a really, really great resource for people to access. Okay. There is a question here that was emailed to me. It says, who governs an HOA and is there a way to dissolve one? It's a great question. Um, the people who govern an HOA is actually the HOA board. Right, the elected or appointed board members, they get to say what the HOA do, will do and will not do. Um, if you as an individual homeowner feel like the board is not following Texas law, you can, you know, what I like to do is try and talk it out. If that doesn't work, you file a lawsuit and say, this is the law and this is what you're doing and fix it. Um, in terms of dissolving an HOA, most HOAs have a provision in their declarations that says if X number, generally it's like 66% or 75% of homeowners vote in favor of dissolving the HOA, then it can be dissolved. Now, under Texas law, you might hear the terms wind down. An HOA is a nonprofit corporation. When a corporation is dissolved, it's wound down. There's a process for doing it. Um, it's not difficult. Um, it's not easy, but um, it's somewhere in the middle and, and, and it's involved. I've personally never been involved in that process because you know, it's, it's kind of outside the priorities for what my law firm does. But um, any, you know, I think an experienced real estate a lawyer could help you and enough homeowners navigate that process if that's something that 
you and the other homeowners really want to pursue. So it's possible. It's just it takes time. Okay, uh, there are two more questions that just popped into the chat. Uh, the board has to agree to mediation or arbitration if it's without a court order with your HOA. Okay, so I, I see that as uh, you know, M Foreman kind of clarifying you know some of the points we were making earlier, and and I think that's piggybacking on what Myra and I were talking about with arbitration. It's a lot of newer HOAs or HOAs that have updated their paperwork are trying to create a, uh, a more streamlined process for dispute resolution or, or just fixing problems, which is mediation. <clears throat> and mediation is, I mean, it's just a fancy word for people getting in the same room and maybe having a third party there to kind of go back and forth and work out your problems. A lot of HOAs are putting that in their bylaws, like, hey, if we have a dispute with a homeowner over fines before, we, before a lawsuit is filed, we will try to mediate it. Um, I see Pete asked a question, can an HOA put a lien on a property for fines assessed but cannot foreclose on this basis, or can they not put a lien on the property for fines? More than likely, and I'm sorry to caveat all of these things, it's just legal information, more than likely the HOA can not put a lien on your property for unpaid uh, fines. Does that mean they won't threaten it? No, I've seen HOAs do things that I think violate debt collection law by saying, oh, we're going to put a lien on your property. It's, you know, Different people will look at the law and think differently. That's why if you engage a lawyer, they give you their legal opinion, right? Um, it's my legal opinion that HOAs cannot put a lien on property if the lien was not already created by the declaration. And I think there's a lot of uh, law that supports my opinion, but I'm not 100% perfect on this. Um, so Pete, short answer is more than likely no. Your HOA cannot put a lien on your property if one does not already exist per the terms of the uh, the HOA's declarations. Okay. Uh, I see. Was it... oh, go ahead. Oh, there was another one here. Um, our HOA, even though it's stipulated in the bylaws, does not provide financial records with receipts or quotes for jobs, even when they are requested through email. As a homeowner, and as the bylaws state, we should have access to all financials yet they refuse to access yet they are we are refused access instead are given an excel type spreadsheet with random numbers and nothing to back up the numbers uh and over the past half year i've received over 120 dollars per month in increases what can be done so <laughs> um this sounds like it might be one of two problems one either you're dealing with a management company that's kind of that that filter for communication or you might be dealing with a, a group of hoa board members who might be in over their head and they're doing their accounting in excel right they, they're keeping track of their books in excel rather than maybe through uh, a, a certified accountant that they hire or through like intuit quickbooks software this i i personally have not run across it but i've heard these stories from my clients and i've seen the documents um the short answer to come back to the original question which is how can i force them to give me the documents is i would encourage you to if it's if there's a management company that's been your primary point of contact find out who the hoa board members are it should be publicly available either on a website or just demand the information from the management company and then reach out to them um and then if, if there's issues with the board, like maybe it's a, what's called a self-managed board, they don't have a private management company helping them keep their books, then I, if, if you feel very strongly about this, if you think you're being financially wronged, or if this is something that you, you believe needs to be fixed, you know, an option is to run for HOA uh, office, and then you'll have access to the information and you can start implementing policies to get this information public. And the nuclear option, forgive my phrase, is to contact a private real estate lawyer and see if he or she can help you sue or demand uh, with maybe a little bit more oomph to, to get the documents. It's unfortunate, sometimes you gotta get a lawyer in the room. I don't know if it's the suit or the diploma or whatever, but it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it sometimes solves the problem. Uh, okay, what else is in here? Uh... Have you had cases with selective actions from HOAs? Um, personally, no, I haven't. But I can tell you that HOAs, because 
most HOAs govern property where there's more than four residential units, they are subject to the Fair Housing Act. That's a federal law that says you cannot discriminate against people when it comes to real estate. Um, and if they're doing some sort of selective actions, if it's related to race or gender or some other protected class, um, there's potential risks that the HOA is violating the Fair Housing Act. So short answer to your question is no, I've not come across that, but I'm very well aware that of what rules HOAs have to follow. Um, and that is potentially another tool if you face that, that kind of problem. I see Robert asking another question, would a fine from an HOA expire after four years? They'll say no, but Texas law says otherwise. Um, oh. more, more than likely, yes. Um, it, it, and, and I don't want to say expire, but um, there's a statute of limitations for collecting debt related to a contract. And wow. I'm, I'm sorry, I just threw a bunch of lawyer language out of it. But let me let me simplify this. How do HOAs get created? It's a contract. When you buy a house in a subdivision or a condo that is subject to an HOA, you are more than likely given a little one page document that says warning or notice or something this property that you're buying is subject to such and such HOA. You can find a copy of all the records here, blah, blah, blah. Um, and because HOAs are, have their powers from contracts, if they're going to try and say you owe some money, well, that money has related to that contract. And Texas law says if, if there's debt that's related to a contract that's not paid, if the HOA doesn't file a lawsuit to collect it, then it's, it, it's subject to that four-year limitation uh, that four-year limitations period to collect. Okay, which goes back to they can sue you for to get a judgment against you, but not necessarily attach a lien for any kind of fines or anything. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Um, one thing I, I as as a realtor and as a housing counselor, I recommend any homeowner or potential homeowner to make sure when you you know when you go through and you actually have that little paper that says your home is subject to an HOA it's in the contract that says do you require or do you want a copy of your bylaws and everything that's related to the HOA most people say no because they don't want the, this huge thick book of all of this stuff or have to pay for the copies or what have you but make sure that you have access or know where to uh to get those copies of things because it's got all those details in it and most homeowners when they go to buy a property, they generally don't. They don't check that box that says that they want a copy. So they don't really know what it is that they're subject to once you know they've actually gone in, into buy, buying that home. And, and if it's one of, a reason being, I've had a couple of clients that have gotten really upset because now, oh, well, the HOA is now telling me I have to do this and this and this and this. Well, it's in your bylaws. You know, it, it 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 says it right there what you're required to do, but you did, you know, you check the box that says that you don't want to get a copy of the record. So, you know, make sure you get a copy. That's all I'm saying. Make sure you get a copy. Robert, uh, you you just came on camera. Was there was there a question? Thank you for joining us today. You just wanted us to see your lovely face, huh? <laughs> yes, good to see y'all. I uh, haven't been attending in a while, but uh, I know. <laughs> I know. Good, to, good to have you back. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Amir. I appreciate uh, your your uh, answers to my questions. Sure thing. And if I can echo what you said, Nia, knowledge is power, right? If you're going to do anything, if you're going to make this simple, the presentation is giving you guys knowledge. Reading the paperwork is giving you knowledge, and when you feel empowered, you feel less screwed over. You know how to work, you know the language that the HOA is speaking and you can engage with them in a way where you feel respected, where you feel like the playing field is level and you feel empowered. And I'm sorry for cutting you off, Myra. I'll mute no, no, no. myself. You and I were saying about to say the same thing is just get educated. Um, that's what it's all about. A, a lot of times we make decisions because we ourselves are not getting educated in the process. And I think that's the, the most important thing. Because when we closed on our home in our third home, you know, they give us this big book, you're right, Mia, and they ask you, do you want it? And and of course, you know, Myra, oh yeah, I want to read it. And my husband looked at me and when we got it, it was a big, big book. He goes, so now you're going to read it. I said, yes, I am. But that's what it's all about is getting educated and being informed because a lot of times most HOAs hope you don't take the time to get educated. So, you know, that's what it's all about.
Pete says, and on that point, uh, on to whom does the responsibility of communicating or researching the existence of an HOA or deed restriction, does it fall upon uh, you as the homeowner? If that's the home that you intend to purchase, it's it's up to you to do your due diligence on on everything that goes on in that area. All the all your realtor, or your lender, or whomever, they're they're there to just broker the deal and to get it done and to let you know, yes, you are in it, you are subject to an HOA, or yes, there is a condo association, you know, and this is who you contact to get all the information. So yeah, so it's definitely up to the actual homeowner. Um, let's if I could add just one point on that last thing. It if you're hearing that and you're thinking, Jesus, everybody's out to get me, let me give you a few <laughs> real easy ways to handle this. I bought my house like 18 months ago for the, in a neighborhood with an HOA, and I've been doing this for 10 years, so I know how it can go sideways, and there was a lot of fear, but empower yourself, right? Like when, you, when I went to go look at the house, I knocked on the neighbor's door. I said, hey, what's going on? I'm looking at the house next door. Got some information about how the HOA works also about the schools and traffic and what have you, you know, stuff that, neighbor, that, that homeowners or condo owners want to know. There's real yeah. easy ways to, to empower yourself with knowledge. You don't have to go and, you know, hit the books. Just yeah. talk, to, talk to the potential neighbors and, and maybe yeah. even your real estate agent can, can answer a lot of the questions that you might have if he or she's intimately familiar with that, that neighborhood or that condo that you're looking at buying in. Just talk exactly. to people. Okay. The, the let me let me remove the, the realtor from that perspective because then you could say, oh, my realtor told me, blah, 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 blah. And you cannot put that liability and onus on your realtor by by no means. So there are some things that go on within an HOA that your realtor does not have that information about. So yeah, but you can ask about the neighborhood itself in general, but I would definitely, as, a, as an easier way, definitely go out and talk to the neighbors too. If you don't want to sit and read through umpteen hundred pages of of of, of uh, deed restrictions and HOA bylaws and what have you, then yeah, talk to the neighbors, ask them. You know how how is the HOA around here? You know, do they fix stuff? You know, what is the pool? What does the maintenance look like? You know, how how often do your fees go up? Uh, you know, each year or you know how is it working with that management company that you know that that runs the HOA? You know, so you know, ask, definitely ask. Um, are there any other questions? We're just coming up on our three o'clock uh, time limit. And I want to make sure we still get everybody's questions or concerns addressed. Let me go back one last time through the chat. And those are all the questions that I had that were emailed to me too. Okay. If I could, I mean, I have a few parting thoughts. Um, Absolutely. Go right ahead. You know, first, don't be scared by an HOA. If you or neighbor or friend or family member are dealing with issues of the homeowners association, I highly encourage you to share this presentation with them. I'm not saying I know everything, but I think this I, I structured this presentation to dispel a lot of myths and to go back what, to what Myra mentioned is empower people. Make sure you educate yourself. You don't have to hit the books. There are different ways to learn information. It's all about either talking to people or reading about it and then you know, stand up for yourself. Sometimes it's harder to do that um, and just be reasonable. But I really want to encourage everyone that, you know, of the 20 or so people here, I bet there's another hundred that really need to hear this information. I encourage you all to share this information with them. And I don't get an ego boost from, from all the shares. I, I, I promise I don't. I don't get paid more from all the shares either. Uh, but I do this for a reason. Um, I'm glad to be he invited here by Ms. Murray and Ms. Dippolite every couple of months. And, um, and, and and really to make sure people know trusted, vetted information because you know, Lone Star Legal Aid is an institution. We make sure we know what we're talking about. Um, I've gone to law school. I've been doing this for 10 years. I can trust what it is that I'm saying. I don't know everything, but I know a lot. And I really hope that you are empowered by this information about homeowners associations today. Absolutely. Well, Myra and I know a lot, but we don't know everything by no means. So that's why we refer to those experts to provide you guys with that information. Um, you know, so uh, again, we can't say what well, Myra said. I'm going to my HOA and she told me to tell you now, you know, we we don't we don't know everything. Plus, we you know, we get educated ourselves. So, you know, 
dealing with a lot of people in, in the different communities if they're not sure uh you know i recall this happened in this workshop and this is what was told but here's the link or here's the information or here's to where you go to get more information about that particular subject uh and with that being said um following the presentation uh here today you'll see the link on your screen to an answer a couple of survey questions if you could um if there are other subjects that are that you that you guys may be interested in that we don't currently offer then please let us know um, that's the only way that we can continue to uh to upgrade um to update our presentations and to know what information um to provide for you guys so uh, we want to thank you guys so much uh, for coming out and participating and continuing to support Mr. Cruz. Great to see you again. Uh, uh, we, used, so we used to do these things in the communities and we used to put the names and the faces together, but now we can only like recognize names. You know, every, every once in a while, we'll get Mr. Cruz here to, you know, pop in on the screen so we can see his face, but otherwise we hardly know. Myra and I sometimes feel like celebrities when we're out. I know you, I saw you on the blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So, but, but thank you guys for coming about. Uh, Maylin, thank you very much. Miss Grace, um, oh, oh wow, Miss Burrell, she's been to quite a few. Miss Foreman, thank you for all of your questions and everything too. Miss Vicky, Miss Cynthia, Mr. Pete, thank you very much. Amir, always a pleasure always informative always a great uh presentation so we really really appreciate it um myra is there anything you'd like to add before we no just keep getting educated keep coming back we're here all of our virtual workshops are free and the reason it is and the reason we call it the month of service is because we want to give back to the houston harris county state of texas community free information it's all about you pass on the information you know, don't hold on to the information you've learned either. Pass it on. Help others get educated also. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, and for those that are not homeowners and you guys know of, of somebody else that, um, you know, they're, that are currently going through some landlord or tenant issues, we're having that presentation on Tuesday at 1 o'clock. So I invite you guys to come back for that. Uh, as well as making sure that you preserve your uh, your generational wealth and, and protect your assets by uh, making sure you have a will or an estate plan. That presentation is next Thursday. Uh, if you need all that information about what makes up an estate plan, the importance of making sure that you have uh, you know, a will, a transfer on death deed, um, beneficiaries on your accounts and so on and so forth, all of that information is gonna be covered by a, uh, our, our partner also with uh, Lone Star Legal Aid on uh, Thursday. So definitely want to come back and get all of that information uh, too. So Mr. Cruz, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I, I'd like to add that uh, I actually uh, have been on our condo board for 15 years and we produce a newsletter. We have 275 owners and I actually had a fellow board member attend this HOA uh, webinar and she was very impressed by the information and she wants to, she's the editor of our newsletter and she wants to post uh, information about it, about your, and so is that okay? Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 And share that link, post it there. Um, the, the Facebook page, our YouTube channel, whichever way people need to get access to it, let us know and we can make sure you get it. Well, we're you, having... We can also email you our monthly uh, uh, virtual script schedule also. So right. make sure if you're interested in, in getting our monthly schedules, let us know. We'll email them to you too. Yes, I get those. I, I get them and I try to attend as many seminars as possible. But uh, yes, you might be getting some more uh, attendees next time uh, because we have a special assessment right now and it's gotten very contentious. And so there are a lot of our, and of course, as, as I mentioned, I've been on our condo board for 15 years and so um, we've had lots of different issues come up where some of the owners are asking for information and uh, I think they would find it very beneficial to attend uh, the next time you have this. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, everybody. All right, Amir, uh, you continue to take care of yourself. Uh, stay well, stay healthy, everybody. And we will see you all again next time. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Miss Grace.